Hi. Welcome to the No, I'm Ashley. I'm Gus. Look, we've had a lot of discussions lately about, well, not just lately, but especially lately, about why developers have been a little bit more gun shy about single player games these days, in particular, single player linear games. Now we've got another theory to add to the mix. It's the streamers. I fault. knew it. I knew it. It's, you know what? Blame the Johns of the world. He streams. Oh, oh, oh. I thought you meant like prostitution Johns. Oh. <laughs> I was like, what the hell are you talking about? I mean, <laughs> I don't know why my mind went there. He might also, look, I don't know, and I'm not going to judge. Uh, <laughs> sorry, John. Well, apparently streamers and Let's Plays are ruining story-driven linear experiences, at least according to one big name developer out there who says gamers would rather watch those games instead of buy them. Which, to some degree, makes sense. Not the first time developers have blamed streaming for a dip in sales, but typically these kinds of comments come from indie developers or something rather than some of the bigger fish in the industry. These newest comments come from an interview with former Uncharted writer Amy Hennig, who was also leading the famously canceled Star Wars game from Visceral Studios. R.I.P. The interview between her and Campo Santo founder Sean Vanaman on Polygon touched on a wide variety of topics, but mostly centered on how to survive in the games industry and what it's like writing story-based games in the current market. They also talk a little bit more about the decision by EA to shut down Visceral Studios and that Star Wars project, and interestingly enough, Hennig feels like some of the reactions to that were overblown, saying that it's a bit premature to say that single-player games are dying just yet. However, she did acknowledge that there is a major issue brewing in the video game industry about how to keep those experiences economically viable. Because according to Hennig, lots of people ask for single player games, they just don't want to buy them, instead they watch them. Yeah, but first, Hennig spoke about the rise in costs of making games because that's always a factor when you're talking about the economics of video game development. She said in the interview, there is a real problem, this line we've been running up to for a lot of years, which is the rise in cost of development and the desires or the demands even of players in terms of hours of gameplay, fidelity, production values, additional modes, all these things. Those pressures end up very real internally. She went on to say, and the $60 price point can't change, right? There's a lot of negative press around monetization, loot boxes, games as a service, etc. But these things are trending now in the industry, especially for larger publishers, as an answer to the problem of rising development costs. Budgets keep going up, the bar keeps getting raised, and it starts making less and less sense to make these games. Actually, a lot of this is pretty similar to some comments that were made just in the last week by Remedy Entertainment Head of Communications, Thomas Pua, who we actually reported on this uh, as well, if you wanna read that, if, you're, if you wanna check out that update. But um, he spoke in a recent interview about why the company's been pivoting to a multiplayer title for their next project, as opposed to single player titles, which is what they've been known for in the past with uh, Alan Wake, Quantum Break, uh, Max Payne, mostly citing the rising demands of players. Players who want to spend more hours in every game they buy, which generally means developing more tools, bigger playgrounds, more systems for them to have fun in, which then drives up development costs. So, I mean, yeah, Hennig is definitely echoing some of that sentiment, but Hennig also went a little bit further than those statements and sort of indirectly placed at least a little bit of the blame on gamers watching Let's Plays. Oh, I don't even know if it's, like, blame necessarily, but just she's noting it as a factor, I guess, because it felt more like a, like an offhand comment. Okay. Um, you know, she didn't seem like super bitter about it, but made a note of, of player preference for sure. Uh, she went on to say, there is also this trend now that as much as people protest and say, why are you canceling a linear story-based game? This is the kind of game we want. People aren't necessarily buying them. They're watching somebody else play them online. Thanks for ruining single player, Achievement Hunter. Yeah. <laughs> You guys! Uh, this criticism is a little funny because of the source. Hennig series Uncharted is a monster seller for PlayStation, while also being streamed by Let's Players. True. Sony just announced it at PSX last month. The series has collectively moved over 41 million copies, so it's not like all of those streamers have significantly put a dent in sales. Although the Uncharted series also started before streaming was a huge thing. True. You know, le even Let's Plays were still building at the time, and you know, and I think un I've seen charts that are showing that like Uncharted sales have slowed a little bit. Not that it stopped a lot of Naughty Dog's single player games from being a huge success. Mm -hmm. I mean, The Last of Us did just fine. Mm -hmm. uh, and let's also not forget here that the other side of the interview is the founder of Campo Santo. Firewatch, a game that can be watched and played in pretty much one sitting. It got a ton of Let's Play coverage. It also sold pretty decently. Vanaman even updates the sales total in the interview, mentioning that Firewatch has sold over 2 million copies. 
When the game came out, it made its money back on the first day with 500,000 copies sold. So it's, I mean, it's not like Let's Play genre has hurt either of those two. Well, it hasn't destroyed them at the very least, although you'll never get exact numbers on what the impact was, positive or negative. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's not the first time someone's made this kind of claim about streamers and Let's Plays affecting sales. And while there are a lot of developers out there who are totally cool with their games being streamed because, hey, Free marketing. You'll get a lot of eyeballs if a popular streamer or a popular Let's Player does something in your game, a lot more people will hear about it. But there are a few who haven't been fans of the practice because they feel like it's eating into their potential paying audience. And of course we saw that last year with Persona 5 publisher Atlas deciding they would consider action against anybody who streamed past a certain point of the game, feeling that it would potentially hurt sales if people saw too many spoilers. For the same sort of philosophy, why buy it and play it if you watch it and get essentially the same experience? And back in 2016, the creator of That Dragon Cancer called people out for streaming the entirety of the small indie game. In a blog post, developer Ryan Green wrote that the studio has not yet seen a single dollar from sales. And he went on to say that they underestimated how many people would be satisfied with only watching the game instead of playing it themselves. Green expressed that while he felt that Let's Plays add value to the medium of video games, he also felt that for a short, relatively linear experience like ours for millions of viewers, Let's Play recordings of our content satisfy their interest and they never go on to interact with the game in the personal way that we intended for it to be experienced. Well, as such, he decided to start content IDing the game's music off of Let's Plays that made a lot of people very happy with him. Not really. No, I, I didn't think that was true. Uh, the thing is, the other side of that argument is that if people really wanted to play your game, they would still play it anyway. Uh, there's also an argument to be made that there's a significant amount of viewers who check out Let's Plays because they're trying to decide if they should follow through with a purchase. And some data seems to show that they have a positive effect on game sales as a result of that. A 2016 study by marketing agency Nevely and analyst firm Nuzu demonstrated that YouTubers wield a ton of power in terms of sales. Of a global audience of 500 million gamers who watch gaming content online, Line, as much as 35% use YouTube just to hear about new games. The study found that traffic on Google looking for Papers, Please saw notably massive increases after coverage by the likes of Total Biscuit, Yogg's Cast, and The Mass Baron on YouTube. But more than that, Gus. I love, fucking Dude. love that game. It's so good. <laughs> Gus, play it. You would not stop talking about it's Papers, amazing. Please. It's amazing. For of the... weeks and weeks and weeks. It's basically like the equivalent of me with Stardew Valley. Yeah, I, like I just won't stop talking about it's it. It's amazing. I mean, I'm going to go reinstall it and play it again right now. Yeah, I mean, we did actually see the same thing too with Stardew Valley, not just from me, but uh, that game sales skyrocketed after a lot of uh, positive coverage by a really big gaming YouTubers, Markiplier, Yogscast, and again, last year with Battlegrounds, which went on to basically become the highest selling PC game of all time. Well, maybe not of all time yet, but it's huge and fueled in large part by how much the game was streamed. But to be fair, not all the games we mentioned are shorter, linear, single player experiences. A lot of them tend to be a little bit more sandboxy or they've got forks that you can go and have your own experience. Still, all of the early indicators seem to show that for the most part, uh, Let's Plays tend to help game sales instead of hurting them. All that being said, Hennig's position is understandable, and while there are a number of 2017 examples of linear experiences selling very well while also being streamed, she's not wrong about the rising cost of games, and that these prospects are becoming a lot riskier, especially if somebody can maybe satisfy their curiosity on YouTube. But a lot of that seems to be laying blame where it doesn't necessarily belong. If the costs of your game require you to sell more copies than you think you're going to be able to sell, then the economically viable choice is to figure out ways to lower the scope and cost of the game. I mean, and honestly, Visceral Games was based out of the Bay Area. In, yeah, in which California. is like the there's rent alone on that place. There's probably cheaper places to do game development. Like anywhere. Uh, for the most part, developers seem to realize that streaming and Let's Plays are here to stay, and many have embraced that fact, but it seems there are always going to be outliers. Yeah, so what do you guys think of Hennig mentioning that gamers would rather watch a lot of linear single-player games than play them? Have you found that to be the case? Have you watched experiences and figured that's good enough? Or do you find linear games to buy based on those? Love to hear your comments, uh, so let us know. And for future updates on developers hating on Let's Plays, remember to like this video. And if you're new around here, subscribe to the No. Hating's a strong word for it. Studios. RIP. The interview between her and Campo Santo founder, Sean Vanaman. Mm -hmm. Okay. All that being said, Hennig's position is understandable, and while there are a number of 2017 examples of linear experiences selling very well while also being streamed, she's not wrong about the rising cost of games, and that these prospects are becoming a lot riskier, especially if somebody can set